Well, good afternoon to everyone. Um, I am an archaeologist indeed. <laughs> I think that's become not very frequent in this session. But I'm currently taking my master's in epistemology of natural and social sciences in Madrid, Spain. And I'm going to talk about, well, as the name says, uh, how we make history and how we perform different narratives and how we um, impose different time perceptions and time temporal notions on the subjects of historical development. Um, I also would like to, to address uh, the many biases involved in the construction of time narratives and temporalities and how archaeology may be an adequate tool to, to give note of them. So, as a brief outline, I will first introduce how I think archaeology is essentially a phenomenology of time. And then we'll continue to try to conceptualize what temporal frames are, to try to answer to the question of when are we, and not only where are we. And we'll make this through the notion of time and temporality. We'll use different key authors of traditional phenomenology, but also we get some notions from several uh, philosophers and archaeologists. And we'll finally treat the issue of intersubjectivity, time, and how it re relates to prehistory and normal history as well. And to conclude, we will delve into how a modern prehistory, that's basically what we have now, can be changed, or how can we make the turn from a typically modern shaped prehistory to a another kind of prehistory. So, how is archaeology a phenomenology of time? Uh, traditionally, historiographically, phenomenology has been um, understood as pure subjectivity, but we know this is not true and that we shouldn't focus only on this. Phenomenology, phenomenology is rather the experience of things, not only material things, not only material objects, but also subjects and um, conceptual objects, etc. So, as Heidegger noted, the phenomena are specific, factual, like a vase, and they accompany mm -hmm. human life or lives. We will see the importance of this plurality later. And in that way, if the phenomenology delves or pretends to be focused into things or material phenomena that appear towards us, to us, who better than the archaeologists can have account of what constitutes the specific manifestations of human life experiences? If we can access the material phenomena, and if we could access the phenomenal experiences of materiality. Uh, what lies the problem for archaeology to be a specific phenomenology of history? Basically, in the fact that historiographically, archaeologists have been asking the so-called wrong questions, basically rooted in the historical cultural <coughs> tradition and the processual tradition, such as what were the causes of the fall of the N prima system, or the statistic measurements of the deviation of the neck of an X base from level I to level IA, and its ground shaking implications, or for example, new radiocarbon dates address popular fictional cultural change to have happened a bit earlier than thought in the whatever site in Excellent. This would not be the adequate uh, kind of questions for a discipline, as I said, but rather would be to try to overcome these artificially set and studied absolutes in philosophical terms, or the grandiloquent metaphors for a constructed abstract world 
far apart from the one that we could try to approach and far apart from the one that people actually lived and experienced <laughs> in past times. So instead, <coughs> an archaeology that works as a phenomenology of time or a phenomenology of history, we will see the difference later, uh, is basically answering or uh, addressing the historicity of experiences that come to together with human concrete distinct lives being in the world modes or different being in the worlds the relation with the body the world the construction of otherness or the thinking of otherness and basically what well, it constitutes different ways to be human because let's remember human is not an absolute category it's a very specifically historical temporal category that we apply today as if it was universal, but there are some doubts about it. So these kind of um, ideas are what we should be able to address through time and through different notions of temporality. So temporal frames, when could we situate ourselves? Uh, for the noting of different notions of time and temporality, I'm going to um, very briefly explain some of the basic notions of some key uh, phenomenologists. For example, time for Heidegger was a mixture between future, past, present, in what he called ecstasy or ecstasies. That would be something like our being in the world but being focused on the past. For example, with the term of Gewissenheit, that is some kind of having beenness. So it would it would be some sort of <coughs> awareness of our own history, awareness of memory, but looking into the future. So just because how we often say History must be studied so we don't repeat the mistakes in the past, mm. or so everybody should be aware of the history to have a better future or to be able to focus on the future, things like that. The very notion of Heidegger towards time is that we are time. As for Husserl, for example, he proposed something called internal time consciousness that was based in intersubjectivity and very linked to it. And um, the phenomenology of time in Husserl uh, basically tries to answer to how things appear to us as temporal, but also how we experience time, so to speak. So what would make possible a unified perception of objects and of course subjects that are considered to be <coughs> part of objects? Um, it would be occurring through successive moments in history, in time, etc., depending on what we call all of them. And that would take, that will have a very clear reflection on how we think about history and speci uh, specifically prehistory today. Also, when talking about phenomenology of time consciousness, we could compare Heidegger's tripartite. Well, the three as main aspects of Heidegger's theory, the joint condition of the future, the past, and the present, with what Husserl uh, addressed as an expectation, memory, perception, imagination, self-awareness, and habituation. All those nine, let's call them categories, are in a way one of the main um, one of the main, sorry, <laughs> I'm get lo getting lost in translation, um, key tools for us to, to try and trace or to try and track how different notions of time and different notions of history, historicity, etc., have been taking form um, through history, let's say. But also, we, we couldn't forget Merleau-Ponty and his kind of synthetic view based on Husserl and Heidegger on time that would no longer be an object 
to, to our knowledge or an object of our knowledge, but rather a dimension of our being. He would be then uh, adopting Heidegger's design in some way. And so we will find that time, finally, is not simply calculated and placed as the analytical dialect has supported, but also experienced and lived as the hermeneutical tradition or in other interpretative traditions have exposed as well. But how can we interpret uh, this kind of time? How can we make the, the jump from not an object of our knowledge, then how can we study it to it becoming a dimension of our being? How can we study our own being? Uh, of course, the hermeneutic tradition has a lot to say about this. So Gadamer addressed the issue in the form of his concept of historicity, which would, it would go in two ways. First of, a, first of them, to research on how and why it is interesting to study and determine set certain time in our time. So what are what would be our main motivations, our deep desires to try and approach such a thing or such a concept, but also to explore the ways in which we would be able to try and access a certain epistemic in the past. It is what Foucault, Foucault called historical a priori. That would be a closed category that we cannot experience again but where there would be certain forms of looking into it and trying to guess some ways to try to make it specific. But also Reinhard Koselik, who is often obliviated when it comes to talk about hermeneutics <coughs> and the dialect that I had with Gadamer and stuff. Uh, Koselik said that well, the most important conditionalities of human experience are space and time intuitions. We will get back to Koselec soon. So, as in a position of archaeology, a specific archaeological position, how can we start interpreting this or tracking these things in archaeology? Mm -hmm. This is what I so-called a situational peripheries model. They Obviously, it's not a model, and I would like to reject any kind of systemical theory <laughs> association. Um, for those of you who are not very familiar with the anthropological ways of representing kinship, uh, triangles represent male uh, individuals, and circles represent female individuals, and the ego, which is always the researching subject is of course represented with a square because it's not specific but in this case I would like to inform you all that that ego is specifically me and that has the consequences that, I, that it does when it comes to what I'm going to explain so we have obviously a, an ego uh, a researcher that is the axis mundi of all interpretation in his discourse um, so egos has two main experiences of time. A vector that would would be called uh, a historical time in which ego is living right now that covers more or less three generations. So it would be tracked to ego's parents and ego's grandparents, and that's the historical time that we can get direct access to. But we also have a historical past all of us. And while we have a historical past, we wouldn't have to forget, we shouldn't forget, that we are always trying to, we are always immersed in a centrality notion or concept that is our own. Different subjects will have different centrality notions and so on. The circles will represent the geographical or spatial uh, variant. This pyramid here, the red one, would be addressing social class and what, well, yeah. So, 
as we are representing ourselves and as ourselves, our history and our heritage, we are separating ourselves in distance, in time, in social class, attending to gender biases and many other biases as well, from the people that we are attempting to represent in this past. So we are always treating them with a distance that has nothing to do with the phenomenological epoche or anything like that. But it's a distance that has to be corrected because it can be corrected. How is the thing that we're going to explore right now? Oh yeah, holding account on how we place historical subjects in relation to our intersubjective notion of time and temporality or how do we understand history? Separating time and space, we engage in the process of the creation of otherness, which is basically what we've been doing like this, situating <coughs> women slightly um, under men, and they're all lower as time goes by in the pyramid of social class, and they are obviously farther away from us in what we call a <coughs> situational perfect. So, coming back to Koselek, Koselek uh, he accounts space and time, and he says that these concepts are over conditioned mm -hmm. by temporal experiences, obviously. And how can we be prepared to determine an objective temporal experience only through the analysis of historical concepts, which is the, the main call of Koselik? He, um, he comes out up with the idea of historical semantics that are part of the, what, what the so-called historica. And it basically consists in being prepared to make an analysis of historical concepts that allow us to experience historical changes through conceptual changes. So as the hermeneutics, it's not an opposed position, but it's a complementary position. So while the hermeneutics uh, work with historical concepts saying that they are historical because they are always associated with effectual history, that is basically the history of effects. A concept will not be the concept in the moment of mm. its initial baptism, as Kripke uh, introduced the term, but it would be an accumulation of practices since they have been interpreted. So the concept has a new meaning, a new referent, a new reference in every present time that it's being interpreted. And as concepts, they don't have to be necessarily theoretical or <laughs> metaphorical, they can be the very concept or notion of human, or the very concept and notion of time, or the very concept and notion of <laughs> me, subject, object, etc. But what really mattered to Koselik is that the fact of this happening doesn't give us uh, subjective experiences nor does it give us access to, to this. And these experiences about how concepts have been changing um, can only be approached through other latent dimensions, such as the interpretation and the study of the historical conditions of the context in which the concept, these concepts raised. So, Intersubjectivity, time, and prehistory. Part of those historical concepts are the notions of time and temporali temporality. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. in strict association with those that we're going to study, because they have obviously a, a, ma a major relevance to the, to the archaeological um, field of study, Corporality and its relation with the self and the world, but also identity and its relation with intersubjectivity, and of course memory, history, and self-awareness with the latter one. So, the idea is that a specific time experience <coughs> associated with an equally specific notion of history, and thus prehistory as well, 
to us has come in the shape of the modernity, shaped by modernity. So Kostelek also says that and addresses a differentiation in modernity temporal modes. That would be a preparatory period, some sort of pre-modern temporality, but very closely linked to the medieval time, time notion, time consciousness. But he also, <coughs> I'm sorry, he also addresses uh, a new concept, what he calls the subtle side. That would be a semantic and conceptual <coughs> revolution of such powerful dimensions as the ones that differentiated modernity from antiquity. So that would be actually ground shaking. The subtle side would organize a new temporality under what constitutes a semantic and conceptual event that would be the great singularizations of modernity. Um, that would phrase or shape to the specifically modern time, which is the time and temporality notion that we are inspired by and that we are continuing. Only that very accelerated. So our time would be an accelerated <coughs> time, but undoubtedly based on that specifically modern time, in which we separated from the plurality of cultures, facts, histories, time, spaces, mm -hmm. chronologies, violences, identities, and we created artificial singularities that have been since ruling over our narratives and taking over our very notion and understanding of historical processes. So, as we've seen, uh, we have a modern prehistory. We are living in a in a modern world, an accelerated modern world that is permanently uh, making reference to other times, to past times, but we are referring to past times, to past uh, experiences, subjects, cultures, etc., in this specific way, the modern way. So, which ways could we try to enhance, to try to make a turn in this so called paradigm? investigation. I would say that obviously archaeology can help a lot to overcome these singularities and binarisms, fake binarisms or dichotomies. And I would say our main call should be gender, queer and feminist archaeologies, intersectional archaeologies, for they reflect, uh, they reflect on notions so important as, for example, corporality, the relation between the mind and the body, world, mind and world, subjectivities, how are the subjects constructed, are they even subjects, is it, is it a universal category, can we talk about it? How is our relationship with materiality, how can be all the relations with materiality understand and addressed and specified and also involved in given protagonism in the academia? How can we address other ontologies and how can we incorporate them to our own research methodology? How can we understand resistant practices when we are obviously not witnessing much of them? And it's also a good call that feminist, queer and uh, gender archaeologists reflect on maintenance activities because I've seen uh, in this presentation so far, that we are, of course, addressing time as product as a product of change. But change means uh, speeding, and our notion of change as uh, as an outstanding um, category to analyze, or as a main focus to analyze instead of others, becomes basically. Um, so it comes from the idea that maintenance activities have been unrelevant or that they shouldn't be having as much as attention as they as as changing in technology or mobility practices and stuff. So also specialization on on work or work specialization has been very closely linked to the mobility and maintenance activities and change in history. 
I would say these four lay, um, last categories <coughs> are one of the, well, four of the main uh, focuses that the mainstream academia and mainstream discourses on histor history and prehistory have been, um, yeah, having, having this, this protagonism. But I really think we should try and change the focus to several other categories to try and see which combinations can we can we shape and if these combinations are pragmatically viable which means that according to our morality are suitable for us and 